pastors who work in the West African tradition that has gone on since ancient times. Um, the current pieces, collaborative pieces, are based on constellations that are visible from both Ghana and the United States. Uh, Virginia earned her uh, BFA in both art and public policy at Duke and received her MFA from Tyler um, School of Art at Temple, Philadelphia. She's currently an associate professor at St. Augustine's University in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, Virginia has won a number of impressive awards. I'm so impressed with the list when I saw it. Um, where do I start? I uh, uses an antiquity conference study grant, African Arts Institute assistance in metal casting, um, uh, the National Endowment for the Arts, an uh, international Hi. I think Virginia has been uh, one of the top pioneers in working between uh, African casting artists and bringing that knowledge to the United States. And I'll turn it over to you to fill out the bio. Thanks, Mary. I didn't know I was so impressed. Um, so, I have one, got one slide at the end. That's what I'm going to put my yes. All right. So, what I would like to talk about with you guys is uh, my Fulbright work, and then I've been back to Ghana five times. Originally, it was because it was cheaper to cast it there and bring the work back. Now, the plane cards are about twice what this plane card was for me. So, um, I started um, working here. Um, I studied at Tyler School of Art and learned the ceramic shell method. Um, Winifred Lutz taught me about it. I don't know if you know her, but she's good. And then I went to Ghana on just basically a learning trip and saw this technique. I was like, this is where it came from. It was so exciting to me. We've got, it, it has um, simple, simple ingredients that almost anyone can afford. That's important for those of you. I, I think there's a, there are a lot of young people here who are end up going to end up being professors soon. And um, if you end up up in a small school, this is a technique you can use right away. You don't have to have a pencil down. Here are the simple ingredients. Clay, sand, fiber, charcoal, beeswax. That's it. It's also known as a green process because it was invented in West Africa at least a thousand years ago, if not earlier. So, in fact, the Bible mentions African metal casters in the Old Testament. So, um, so it's a green process. It's still used by modern people, people living right now. Um, but it happens to be uh, an appropriate technology for them because none of them have deep pockets. Um, and no iron furnace is necessary. So even though, I mean, it's wonderful to use iron, if you don't have a friend down the road who has a furnace, um, you can still do this. Um, you can make your own furnace. And for small colleges with no budget and no facilities, it's especially useful. But it's also fun if, you know, even if you're Wayne Potratz and you've got every single thing you could want for metal casting, he still does uh, simple methods, you know, um, like the um, Mesoamerican casting techniques. I teach primarily black students, and so this t um, helps me sort of emphasize to them the value of their ancestry, that, you know, of course a lot of their work influenced abstraction in the, the 19th and 20th century, but also technological innovations were things that they contributed to world culture. Um, and I'm an O'Bruni, according to the Ghanaian culture, but they're still okay with me passing um, this tradition on to young black artists in America. So. Um, one last thing. So I had to translate this process from Ghana to the USA. In doing that, I had to figure out the, um, the fuel I needed. I didn't realize that was my primary problem. But by a wonderful coincidence, the theme of this, some of this, was coal. And American coal was finally my solution. So I'm going to pass around bags of things that are kind of dirty, like Ghanaian charcoal, American charcoal, Anthracite coal and bituminous coal, you're welcome to open them if you want to get black fingers. So, Ghanaian charcoal, beautiful, wonderful. Um, 
it's made made from trash trees in the in the um, native rainforest, not mahogany. But you know the the tight, tight, tight um, uh, cell structure of mahogany that makes that beautiful rippling. Okay. Mahogany developed that, evolved that, because it needed protection against insects. So even, even the trash trees that no one uses for um, building anything still have that kind of tight cell structure. And that is what makes this Canadian charcoal so hard, so hot. Um, if the, you know, just the charcoal itself will be burned for over four hours. American charcoal pretty much turns to dust within a half an hour or an hour. Um, so that is why I love Canadian charcoal. You know, look at it in bright light later on and you'll see it almost looks like a mineral. So American charcoal is swell for barbecues, but it does not work great in furnaces. My original furnaces in the U.S. used American charcoal and then propane burners to keep it hot. Well, basically by the, by the end of an hour, it was just propane, which was not really satisfying since propane is fairly expensive and it's not the technique. Um, I've also used coke, but it makes hot spots in a furnace. <coughs> and this, these furnaces need to be far more even. So, anthracite coal, does the answer to all my dreams. Um, I was uh, teaching in Kentucky and they happen to have this coal in the area. It's hard, it has very few impurities, it burns hot. It's beautiful. So if you ever get a chance to use it, use it. Bituminous coal is what is in my area. Far less satisfactory solution, but it does work and it will get, get the furnaces hot. Unfortunately, it's very soft. You can carve this with a knife, you know, a pocket knife. Um, and it has an extraordinary amount of impurities. So instead of what anthracite coal does, which is has huge belches of smoke in the beginning, but then burns clean, this continues the beautiful belching smoke for as long as the furnace goes, and you have to work hard to even you know find where the mold is as opposed to the coal. So there's the tuminous. So play with those, have fun. Um, and here's an example of what they cast in the village. The turtle design is my own just because I knew it would sell well, so it increased the incomes in the village. And these guys make about $400 a year. So a lot of the people here, even in entry level jobs, you make 500 times what they make. And, well, and, and once you get promoted, you'll be making a thousand times what they make. So I know that the um, the standard, the, the, uh, the expensive living is cheaper over there, but everyone wants to be able to buy malaria medicine, right? So um, that's why sales are important to them. I've raised money uh, by the sales of stuff like that and tiny little figures um, uh, about that big, um, to put three girls through school, and they just graduated. So. so. So the bituminous coal is what I have to use locally until I find some more marvelous anthracite. So now we're going to go on to the first slide. Okay, these are the people who taught me how to cast metal. Um, this is Paul, uh, Paul and Ponsar right there. This is Kofi Amponsen, the two people I'm collaborating with in my current installations. And next slide. Okay, Joseph Ajima. Uh, my mentor and their mentor, um, believe it or not, he's my age, you can't tell it. Um, and he has been casting metal since he was seven or eight as an apprentice. And so now he's in London, but he's our teacher. Okay, this is how a West African furnace works. Uh, I've done a talk before about how the process works. Uh, but I never got to explain the furnace, and the furnace is one of their remarkable innovations. So imagine a giant shoebox that is eight feet long, four feet wide, and three feet high. So about you know the height of these desks, so you can still lean over and get into them. So here's four feet wide, eight feet long. Here's the entrance. 
and there's a three feet tall. About every six to eight inches, they put a blowhole. Not that big. And it's that size, so they can actually put a pipe in there and blow. They've got probably one blower, and they move all around to make this evenly uh, hot. So they know the fire well. Um, they know the charcoal well. There's a furnace wall. This is the black is the charcoal all around these circles, which are molds. Um, this is the back of the furnace, big old low hole. The largest molds are in the back. The smaller ones are in the front. This size mold could conceivably fit 200 molds. I don't need anything that big, so I built something smaller. Um, so notice the blow holes, and then they stop at the very end. <coughs> you pile the molds in, and there's a breakdown wall to keep them all in. And that, this is an aerial view. Okay. This is a cross section. Okay, so you've got blow holes all along here. It's three feet tall. There's a huge layer of charcoal at the bottom, the biggest layer. Then we've got molds in the middle, and then a layer of charcoal on top. So I hope that gives you sort of a mental image of what this looks like. Can you go to that one weird slide? This is a slide that would not translate for me. Evidently, it's native to my machine, and I'm way glad and grateful that you can bring it up. So, this is good enough. Okay, that's even better. Okay, so here they are in Africa, in Ghana, in the small village of Krokrom, building the furnace. And you will see eight feet long, four feet wide, three feet tall. It is made entirely of mud brick, which means basically just dirt, um, with a little bit of clay, um, slapped into wooden molds about the size of a cinder block. They were building a latrine so that extra dirt got put in there. They use everything. So these are all mud bricks. This is clay and fiber together. It's the mortar. They put it all together like this. And at the first firing, when it goes to 2,000 or 1,800 degrees, that's when the entire furnace is fired and becomes hard. Up to then, it can be washed away. Are you talking uh, Fahrenheit or Celsius? <coughs> Fahrenheit. Uh -huh. I don't talk about Celsius. <laughs> um, one last thing to notice is that they build buttresses to keep these long walls up, which I thought was really fascinating. It's the only time I've used the word buttress outside of our history. So, and then we we'll go back to that. Right here. Number six. Number six. Okay. For those of you who haven't heard my talk earlier, I'm going to run through the process really quickly because I want to get to the furnaces. So, um, imagine that you have a mold that's got turtles in it, um, and it's, these are covered in charcoal. So it's, there's the charcoal. Um, and then there's clay around that. Then you have a crucible full of scrap metal, usually machine parts. You attach the two. Okay? And you cover the whole thing with more clay. Okay? So you can get a large mold that's about that tall. Okay, you put this um, mold into a furnace, crucible side <coughs> on the bottom. The, the charcoal gets it really hot and makes it molten. Then, when about four hours have gone by, um, you can tell when it's ready to be pulled out. So you pull that out the breakdown wall, use things that look like raccoon tongs to pull this out, flip it over, and that's a gravity pull. Right? Is that clear to everybody? Okay. So, we start off making waxes. These are little containers that people would put um, ashes in. Okay. And then go to the next one. And you get them wet, so they are permeable and will soak up um, very, very, very tiny particles of charcoal. That's the secret to the detail. Okay, and you get a small boy to pound the charcoal, usually by bribing him. So, and this is the Ghanaian charcoal, very, very hard. Um, so then you sift it, like we're going to be sifting manure soon, and you get very, very fine particles, and you dip them in a combination of um, 
uh, a little bit of clay and a lot of water to cover them, like these are covered, and then you go on to the next picture. And can you tell that these are little men mm -hmm. in here, little stick figures? Okay, so these have the first layer of fine charcoal on them. And you let them dry, <coughs> just like in ceramic shell. In fact, the guys who invented ceramic shell gave West Africans credit for inspiring them. Next one. Okay, and then you put coarse charcoal over them and you get this sort of pot-like shape. Um, and there are sprues. Okay, you've got, you've got this pot-like shape and this is the only woman in the foundry. Um, and you scratch in to put these tiny little screws, screws in that look like sticks, right? You pinch them together to one point, and so that the crucible molten metal can flow in. Okay, next one. Okay, and now you can see how they're wrapping that charcoal shape with clay. This is clay that has fiber in it, so it can stand a little beating, a little banging around. And that clay, you know, there's a little screw hole right in there. Next one. And you melt out the wax. Now, if there's a lot of wax, you uh, sink a metal pan underneath there and catch it all and recycle it. These guys don't waste anything. Okay, then we've got, we make the little cups, the crucibles. This is a gravity pour. They can't afford to splash any metal. They don't have money to waste. So, you've got these tiny little cups. Some of them are one pound, some of them are two pounds. That's about as big as it usually goes. And you dry them and you attach them to, see the little pod things that were the original mold? Okay, and then you, you fill these crucibles with scrap metal, put them together, wrap them all together in more clay. I've been told by small American boys that these are dinosaur eggs. Mm -hmm. An entire big, uh, Boy Scout group told me that. Okay, now here I am attaching the two, so it should be really obvious. There's the mold, there's the crucible. Then I cover the whole thing with clay. And when that all dries thoroughly, um, we put them into the furnace that you saw before. So here, there's a layer of charcoal under there, and here are the um, the pots, the, the molds, um, and you can see how sometimes they're stacked. That's how you can get 200 molds in a furnace like this. Virginia, are the are the crucibles? Are they is the metal above or is it on the bottom? It's on the bottom. Okay, that's right. Okay. It's on the bottom because that's where most of the charcoal mm -hmm. is. Okay. So it's getting really hot there, and you want the molds to be a little bit cooler so they don't crack. Not right. right. So next one. Okay, so here's. They're, they are running a furnace. Notice here that this furnace looks like it's been through a war. Okay. It's, it's practically rubble. And the reason is, is it's going to have three years of nearly continuous use. So a um, lead brick furnace doesn't last longer than that usually. Okay, so we got, uh, here's Kofi and Sen, um, poking a blower through the blow holes. The blow holes are, the holes are like every six to eight inches. So you, he can get in, get to the fire all the way up and down those eight feet. And he knows charcoal fires well enough. He can tell what's cool and what's warm. And he's taught me that, but it took me a while. Um, now you can tell it's almost time to break down the wall because this charcoal, which was black, right, like the charcoal you see, has got this um, sort of really nasty, unattractive yellow film on the top. And that means fumes are coming up and some of the brass and bronze particles are coming down and hitting the charcoal. So, it's very, very hot. At this point, it's the right temperature. This takes about four, four and a half hours. Okay, and here's the breakdown wall. We're about to break it down. Okay, here's the drama shot. Okay, two guys at the same time breaking down, pulling out the breakdown wall, pulling out the molds, Crucibles on the bottom, flipping them, gravity pour, the mold is being filled. Um, I can't lift them that high myself. I just drag them out and turn them. Okay. So, there. And then once you get them out, you knock off the top. I, I 
someone's doing right here. It's so knocking off the top, and you're checking to see that all the metal inside the crucible has melted, but it didn't have a cold spot. And that means it flowed into the mold. And then you clean the metal using all the safety equipment available. And even when I gave them safety equipment, they thought it was ridiculous. So this is Paul Unclensem, also one of my collaborators, who is cutting off screws with a hacksaw. And after you do that, um, and you uh, use some wire brushes to clean them off, you soak them in a citrus wash or lemonade or limeade. Um, there's a, a lion floating out there. And you get gorgeous bracelets, just like the ones the Ashanti Henny, the chief of the Ashantis, wears. And the next one. And here, there's his sister. You can see that's her golden jewelry there, there. Um, they also use this process for making containers for ashes that you put the ashes of a chief in mixed with a little gold after he dies. And there he is in all his splendid glory. Um, okay, next. Okay, next one. Yeah. Okay, furnaces in the USA. I can talk a little more slowly. This first we got a grant to use in two universities in the U.S., especially Northern Kentucky University, which provided the anthracite coal. Um, now we did this all on an NEA grant, which was made smaller. Um, so of course the first thing they cut is all these expensive materials we use, like brick. Um, so we had to use cinder block. Um, so these are about the size of the mud brick, but not as durable. And basically <coughs> they used this three times and then it became a fiery pit for printers. So these are all cinder blocks built up the same way you saw before. And then stuccoed with mud and putty. You can see we've got <coughs> the blow holes in here, and this is the breakdown wall. And now we've loaded all the molds in. You've seen that before. Here is the anthracite coal. Here's the first stages of it when we got it burning. There's a second stage. Yeah, so you get it's nasty disgusting yellow black smoke. But if you go to the next one. Oh. Anyway, <laughs> there was a shovel in the other picture and, and yeah. Yeah, for the one before this? Yeah, that shovel. Okay, you go to the next one. There is a furnace and human beings in there. So it's the anthracite is still smoky. But then you go to the next and you see how the smoke is burned off. And then you've got, here's the breakdown wall, nasty, muddy, cruddy. And so then look at this. Breakdown wall. What? You kicked up the breakdown wall? I yeah. Said there's before, so yeah. You used to kick that up. Well, yeah, you kick up the breakdown wall just so you don't get like um, holes where fire will poke out. Oh, is that just a concept you're using? Or that? This? Yeah. That's mud. Just play. Okay, sure. It's just mud. Okay. You know, basically. And if these uh, furnaces, ever start wearing and get broken down, you just slap on them. So that's a repair job. So gorgeous black coal that's continuing to burn, burning hot. And next one. Okay, and you can see the breakdown wall. It's maintaining its shape. This is two hours into the fire. And then it starts just smoldering and smoking. Okay, this is Pauline Ponsa. Pull it, he's pulled out a mold, and you can see we're having a little trouble with that mold. You see how it's got a crack right here? <clears throat> right there? You don't want that. That's where you might lose a turtle or something. So, I was the mudder, and so I slapped mud on it. it. It cools the metal, stops it from bleeding out, so you get less um, flashing. And basically, if you see a white woman here, it's probably me. So, and and here are the other molds. So this is the dinosaur. Okay. There, it's it's covered with that weird um, uh, yellowish uh, surface. Okay, and we pull each of these out one of the, one at a time and flip them all over. And then the next one. Here they are cooling. 
give them a half an hour, and you can break them and get um, little masks and little shapes. And for this project, for, it was a learning intro project, so masks are not that big. Not as big as my head. How much can you actually go? I have done castings that were 12 inches by 8 inches by like 3 inches. That was really, really pushing the process. Mm -hmm. But they did it for me because I really, really wanted it and I was paying them. So, mm -hmm. so next one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, this is at my college. I have an, ass an assistant named Parrish Richardson. He's about a foot taller than I am. So here I am, I've laid this out and we're mudding up the furnace. <coughs> this is our workspace. It's an abandoned dumpster site. So it's got no, you know, it's got no um, uh, lines for natural gas. It does have a hose. But aside from that, we made this into a little boundary pit. So here I am pegging the clay. That's how you make the clay for covering the furnace, you stomp it. It's a glamour shot. And we've got sand, fiber, and recycled clay from the ceramics class. And then we start laying the brick. And um, here's Parrish laying it very carefully. And here's me a little frustrated with it, but it does they, our bricks lay pretty easily, and this furnace could last much longer than the other furnaces. Okay. And um, here's Parrish's face. Um, but you can tell that you know, we're not using regular mortar. The, the clay is working out just fine. If we used regular mortar, uh, you know, of course, and cement can trap some moisture, so you don't want to do that. So you're not using fiber, are you? Oh, no. No. Because... It's expensive, and we got all this brick donated. So, because this was on a tiny, tiny little grant. So, laying the last brick in the furnace. Oh, and I should mention, you see this, that's tarp. You don't want, after you lay it all, uh, then you can let it dry. You don't want it to dry in sections, because it'll crack like a pot cracks. <coughs> um, and, Here's the secret trick that Joseph Ajimam taught me and the other younger guys. Um, and he wants the whole world to know about it. It's not secret. Okay. You make all the corners and on the sides and on the bottom like a bathtub. Okay. It saves in the amount of charcoal you use. It saves in the speed with which you heat it. And um, it, it also keeps this from breaking down so easily. You know, the walls form the moat. So here we are, you know, adding a whole lot of clay right here. We added even more. Okay. And you see how you slime it in. Um, it really does look like a bathtub once you're done. So keep that in mind. And here we are using it. Now, yes, we're using bituminous coal. That's why he's got an apron over his face. But he did get into it and help me more. Um, so I'm trying to dig the molds out of here. So, and we've got smoke everywhere. It actually looks denser than the photo, but we got everything out. And here's the breakdown wall. I think that's the last picture. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So, oh, here. We've got some of the little molds are all finished and are cool. So that's our translation. If you can ever find anthracite coal, use it. Uh, the tuners coal will work. And uh, that's it. I was there time for questions. Yeah, I, I think let's take five minutes for questions. Um, so go ahead. Um, I have a couple questions for you. What type of fiber are you using? Um, over there, they use um, palm nut fiber, um, which is uh, basically a leftover. Everything is recycled. Okay, so it's a leftover from when they make palm nut soup. I use pine straw. I've tried straw. It doesn't work well because it swells. And so it's, it's difficult to move around. Pine straw is great, especially if you can put it through a, a chip or a cup. What's pine straw? Pine straw? Mm -hmm. It comes off of pine trees, like the pine needles. Like pine needles? Yeah, pine oh, needles. Okay. Sorry, we get so much of it, we use it for straw. 
Um, and then my other question for you, you said that you mentioned that you soak the castings when they're finished in a citrus yeah. sort of bath. What, it, what does that do for the casting? Is well, that it's part of the slightly cleanup? acidic. Okay. So it gets off some of the, um, the charcoal in the narrow little spots. Okay. But part of the reason I like this process so much is some of the charcoal stays. So it brings up all right. the detail that you want. Is it possible to cast the iron like this way? I've been told yes, but not in this particular kind of furnace. In fact, what's happening tomorrow is Becca is making um, an African style dung mold with an opening on the top, and they are going to pour iron into it. But with this particular kind of furnace, taking it up another thousand degrees would break down the furnace. So, how hot did you get there? Two thousand. Two thousand. Okay, and the the molds are made of the same material as the furnace itself. Yeah, basically clay. Right. Yeah. And frankly, probably low fire clay. You know, we definitely use low fire clay, and I think in Africa, in Ghana, that's what they had. So. And you can't get to the temperature to melt iron with just coal and fire. No, iron is like what, 2,700? 2,400. I just say 3,000 because it seems really hot to me. <laughs> <laughs> but no, if you get it, if you get it much higher, things start just breaking down. But you can you can melt iron with charcoal as a fuel source. Mm -hmm. That's how they used to do it. It just takes a lot longer. Yeah. To melt. And I think that the high quality charcoal is the key. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I wonder, like, have you ever looked into like using like a maple or something like that as a hardwood? Yeah, charcoal, I did. Right? I tried to make my own charcoal uh -huh. using oak. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, and it still wasn't satisfying. Still not The temperate zone trees just aren't as hard as. Mm -hmm. Oh, I had a question about the, the grass or the grass. How are you? Or, or what are they? Yeah. Whatever's available. Whatever's available. Yeah. yeah. And so they knew I liked bronze. I liked that reddish color. Mm -hmm. So they saved all the bronze for me. But off, but they prefer brass because it's yellower, <coughs> and they want something as close to, close gold, to gold as possible. Yeah. And a lot of those those that jewelry you saw was gold plated. Because the Ashantis live on top of massive gold mines. And they used to be extraordinarily rich until the British came and basically forced them to sell the land. Virginia, so. did you say where in Ghana? Where was this? Oh, it's near Kumasi, which is the second largest town. It's, and the village is called Profra. Is it that particular region where they? Yeah, the central this? region is where they do most of the crafts, uh -huh. period. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, if you go there, go to Kumasi. How many boundaries do you think are there? The boundaries there? Yeah. There are 40 families. Yeah. So I would guess 30 boundaries. Yeah. Each family has their own boundary. Yeah. One final question, Virginia. Uh, what, what about um, the microfinance aspect? Uh, you know, you've, you've talked a little bit about how this helps the villages. And, uh, so how is microfinance works better for the women because it's really micro. Microfinance is usually $10, $20. And for them, they need more money than that to, to make, even to make one, one, one run in the furnace. So the guys kind of scoff at it, and the women snap it up as soon as they can get it. Interesting. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. Thank you so much. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Really interesting. Yeah.